Hello and welcome to Prairie Pulse. Coming up a little bit later in the show, we'll uh, profile Minot artist Walter Peel. But first up, we have the president, actually the interim president of Concordia College with, the, with us, Dr. Paul Dovery. Dr. Dovery, thanks so much for joining us today. Good to be here. As we get started today, first off, tell the people a little bit about yourself and your background. Yeah. I grew up in west central Minnesota, about 170 miles south of Moorhead. Came to Concordia as an undergraduate, spent some time in graduate school at uh, Northwestern University. I taught there briefly and then came to uh, Concordia as a faculty member in 1963. Ended up doing administrative work as dean of the college and then uh, became president in 1975 for a 24 year stint. 1975, yeah. retired in 1999. 99, right. Uh, so, you know. What made you want to be the college uh, president? I mean, you were a graduate, and right. I believe you said the first graduate to ever be the president. Right. Uh, I think of it as serendipity. Uh, you know, I came into the college. There were lots of opportunities for leadership, and I sort of marched through those offices, if you will, without any plan in mind at all. And, uh, in fact, when I was asked would I consider becoming president, I said, I've got to think about this. I had just not uh, paused to think about the enormity of the task and whether or not it was <laughs> right for me. So, uh, as they say, I think uh, I was kind of a serendipitous mm -hmm. career path. <laughs> well, yeah, a graduate and then a faculty member and then to become president at uh, Concordia College in Moorhead. And you're from Minnesota, so, right, you know, right. so many presidents have to move to become that's right. a president. That's right. Yeah, that's uh, the usual path. Okay. Well, first off, let's talk a little bit about uh, the former president there, Dr. Yes. Pamela um, Jolliker, who passed away um, suddenly, I guess. Uh, that had to be a, a horrific shock for the campus. Yes, it really was. And uh, I think it's fair to say that, you know, the campus continues to grieve for her loss. She had uh, so much energy, uh, so much brilliance and uh, strength uh, she was able to capture the imagination and the loyalty of the college community very quickly and uh, had the college on a wonderful path of uh, movement uh, into the future. Uh, so, yeah, really, she is greatly missed. Yeah, can you talk a little bit more then about what her legacy mm -hmm. is or, uh, for, at Concordia? You know, one of the things that she said we had to get over at Concordia was our militant modesty you know, a statement that describes well the sort of upper Midwestern uh, humility, if you will, because she found so many things in this area and at the college that she thought of as gems. And so she really tried to uh, call attention to our strengths and encourage us to build on those strengths. High quality teaching, high quality programs, uh, strong reputation in some areas, unknown in others. And she wanted to project, uh, if you will, the quality of this region and, and of the college. Mm -hmm. And what were some of the key initiatives or mm -hmm. uh, things that she implemented while she, while she was president? The, I think one of the biggest was to expand our uh, global education programs. And that had to do with both things we were doing on campus and things we were doing through our uh, International Language Villages program. So that would be one area, the international program. The second thing was to improve the profile of our students. So we saw a significant improvement in the academic profile of incoming students. I think we had uh, three or four years in a row uh, when we had the best qualified classes uh, ever in the history of the college uh, entering. Uh, that's another, uh, improving our retention from about 78% of students returning to 84% in the past year. Uh, moving to establish uh, a school of business to uh, get that moving and headed in the right direction. Uh, thinking about our facilities and where we needed to make uh, progress in improving and bringing facilities up to date. Uh, these would be among several, uh, I think, noteworthy uh, objectives. We also completed the renovation of the Knutson Center uh, during her years as uh, our president. So uh, across the board, uh, mm -hmm. things really moved. Mm. Well, with that, uh, when you were approached uh, about becoming interim president, and you may even com uh, comment a little bit about this is not the first time you've been interim, right. what made you say yes? Well, I think a couple of things. Uh, number one, I have a strong loyalty to this college, 
and I've always felt that I will respond if I feel that I'm able to do the work that's uh, called for. Uh, I think the second thing was uh, Pam and I had been good friends and uh, she, she was a good friend and we, we talked often about the work of the college. So I felt a kinship with her and with her agenda, if you will, and her vision. And I think finally the board said, uh, this is not a year when we want to stand still. We want to keep this, this agenda, strategic agenda moving. And uh, that I respond very well to that idea. Mm -hmm. Well, sure. Can you talk about how things are going uh, in, so far in the fall semester? You know, yes, I can. Uh, they're going really well. We started school a couple of weeks ago. We have an, enrol an enrollment identical with last year's enrollment, 2810, and uh, so we're feeling good about that. Uh, we've got uh, some program initiatives that have a lot of uh, momentum behind them. Uh, later this week, we will announce uh, the uh, naming of a school of business at the college, and that will move forward. We're well along with uh, fundraising for it, and that will move forward. So we have a lot of, uh, of energy, a lot of excitement. Mm -hmm. Well, I can assume, and again, assumptions are what they are, but that uh, with your history, you're a logical person for, for the uh, board to turn to and say, can you help us out? But how has the adjustment been with the students, the, the mm -hmm. faculty, and the staff? You know, people have been so uh, accepting and positive toward me, I, I can't imagine, uh, you know, a greater blessing than uh, I've received in, in coming to the campus. Uh, I, of course, know a number of the faculty members. Uh, most of them were here when I was last in service uh, six years ago. I don't know any, the students are all new to me, of course. Mm -hmm. But uh, today's students are uh, very friendly, and they think well of older people, <laughs> of which I am one. So uh, that part's gone very well, too. Well, let's turn now to t talk about the uh, search process for the, the new and, I guess, permanent uh, president, right. we'll call it. Uh, how's that going and sort of what's the timeline? The, the committee has now been uh, approved by the Board of Regents and they will meet this week for the first time. Um, uh, as I understand it, their first task is uh, to go to the community, to the students, to the faculty, to the staff, to the alumni, to the Board of Regents and inquire what qualities uh, should we be looking for in uh, searching for a new president. And out of that process will come a kind of description of the position, a description of the criteria that they will look for, and then they'll move into the search process and uh, hopefully, you know, find the right person so that uh, no later the next summer that person can be on board. But I think wisely, uh, the committee has not established a kind of set of deadlines. They will take the time it requires to do this job effectively. And if that means they pause and do something different and take their time, you know, that's what they'll do. Well, with that, and, and of course, uh, I guess you, you can always defer to the committee since they've just recently met. Right. What are the qualities that you think uh, you'll be looking for for a new president at Concordia? Mm. Well... I expect they'll be looking for someone with uh, relevant experience, which would be, you know, higher education or higher education related. Uh, I would expect uh, that they will be looking for someone who uh, works strategically, who can, uh, who can envision, help the community envision its future and march toward it in a systematic way. And I'm sure they'll look for someone who can communicate well with the constituencies, uh, both on and off campus, I think those are some things that they would look for. And obviously, they'll look for someone who is uh, committed to the kind of institution that we are. Now, you mentioned uh, fall enrollment figures. Uh, re oh, tell us again, fall enrollment, how that compares with yeah. past years? Well, 2810, and it was 2811 mm -hmm. last year. Okay. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> All right, so, so yeah. fairly stable or flat, Sta but really is, 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 that, yeah. is that where the university needs to be, or is there room for growth? You know, our, uh, our comfort range, I would say, is between 26 and 2800. We have, much, we have many more than 2800 students, and we get crowded, uh, mm -hmm. both in terms of our plant capacity and in terms of our staffing. And uh, so I would say we're in, we're in our comfort zone. And we'll move around in that zone a little bit, depending upon you know, who applies and who qualifies and all of that. Yes, sir. And of course, Concordia is a private institution, but right. can you talk about how it's funded and how that funding's going? Sure. Well, uh, 
ba basically the operating budget, you know, what, what, how you pay for salaries and erasers and toilet paper, <laughs> that current operating budget. Um, most of that comes from tuition. So we're very highly dependent on tuition. And uh, then we depend on gifts and we depend on uh, uh, endowment income for the balance. So the largest driver in our budget is tuition. And then second would be annual gifts and third would be endowment. Okay. And, and, they're, and they've been healthy. Our endowment, of course, declined with the stock market uh, you know, three years ago, and it's come back some now, not quite back to that level yet. Our gift income, I think, has uh, made up some of that difference because people have been uh, really generous. Can you talk some about uh, some of the key majors that you have there at mm -hmm. Concordia? Our largest major would be business, and, and close to it would be music and uh, biology, the sciences, psychology, communications. They would be among our largest programs, but business would... Uh, over 20% of our students would uh, major in some field of business. With that, uh, what, what is it in your mind that makes Concordia special? I, I think uh, three things I would point to. One is a strong sense of community. Most of our students live on campus. Uh, the student-faculty ratio is very small. The staff-student ratio is very low. So there's a lot of connection between staff and faculty and students. So I think that sense of community is really strong. Uh, second quality would be the liberal arts. We focus on those skills of problem solving and communication and analysis and creative thinking that uh, are really in high demand these days, particularly in, econ in an economy that is so <laughs> uh, flexible and changing. The third thing would be our faith tradition. And uh, we have a Lutheran heritage, if you will, and students uh, have a chance to be exposed to the great religious traditions, particularly the Christian tradition. Uh, and yet, uh, I, would, I would say uh, that's available to people. It's not forced on anybody, but uh, we think that dialogue uh, between faith, what one believes, and one's learning uh, is a really critical, essential kind of dialogue to have on a campus like ours. Well, and with that, uh, the Lutheran emphasis you talked about, uh, can you talk about the other religious backgrounds are uh, welcome to enroll and uh, be well, a part sure of Concordia? Are. Yeah, they sure are. In fact, just slightly over half our students are Lutheran, and the second largest denomination would be uh, Roman Catholic. Uh, and, uh, and then we have the other denominations, plus we would have uh, Muslim students, Hindu students. And uh, I think the, the, the welcoming environment is very important to us. That's a Lutheran tradition of welcoming people of other faiths, being in conversation with them, finding common ground with them, and those are values that are important to us. Okay. Uh, can you talk a bit more about uh, two things that uh, many people know about, and, and I think you mentioned earlier, but the language camp and, of course, the Concordia Choir? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, the, they're, uh, certainly they're the two things for which we're best known, and uh, the choir will, again, this year tour nationally, this time to the East Coast and they'll tour in the spring internationally to South Korea. Uh, but we have a, a world-renowned conductor-composer, uh, one of the most prolific choral composers in the United States at the moment is Rene Claussen. So we're very proud of that and that our students have, you know, the benefit of that uh, gift. And our, our language villages are similarly uh, known uh, uh, around the country and in some sense around the world. This summer, for example, we had visitors from the United Nations under secretary. Uh, we had uh, the ambassador from Germany. Uh, so so we, we have that kind of uh, uh, attention and interaction. There are 15 languages that we offer in terms of summer village programs. And uh, so it's just a real gem, a hmm. remarkable program. It is. I've heard many things about it. Can you talk uh, a bit about the sports at Concordia and what role that plays uh, at the university? Yeah. You know, uh, the sports are, are really big. We have more students involved in, in sports than any other activity, and we have more students involved in intercollegiate athletics than either of the larger universities in this community because we, you know, in a Division three philosophy, the idea is <laughs> let, everybody, <laughs> let everybody participate as, as much so as is humanly possible, if you will. So that's a real mark of strength and something that uh, we enjoy a lot. Okay. Talk about what are your goals uh, during your t term as uh, interim president here. Yeah. 
my goal is to keep uh, the strategic uh, momentum moving forward. And I think of that as in three areas principally. I think of it in terms of the continuing work we're doing on our curriculum, our academic programs. I think in terms of the planning for a new uh, business school. And I also think about uh, our campus master plan to keep that uh, rolling out as we move forward. Those would be kind of three key uh, objectives for the year. But, but the essence of it is to keep the momentum of the college uh, moving forward. Uh, what about the long-term goals for Concordia, five to 10 years, maybe even longer down the road? Where do you see the campus going during that time? Yeah. Well, I, I see uh, one of the, we've just completed a strategic plan for the next five years and included in, in that plan uh, our improvements in uh, our uh, facilities for the sciences. And uh, we're moving to a new kind of interactive modality in teaching science. And so you need a different kind of laboratory, for example. You need different learning environments for that. And uh, that's, that's a long-term pull. But uh, we've identified that goal and I think are moving toward it. Uh, second objective is to improve the quality of advisement and career counseling for all of our students. We do that now, but we're trying to fine tune that so that every student really has a high quality experience in uh, career development and advising. Those would be two or three. We want to strengthen our financial footings naturally. Uh, continue to build our endowment, and uh, that would be, you know, another thing important to us going forward. As an interim president here, do, do you see, are there any challenges with sort of short-term and long-term goals, or because obviously you know you're interim, people, right. so are, or is it just you feel like the college is ready to go forward, and so there's not a real issue there? No, there really isn't an issue. I think that, I think people would be disappointed if we put the place in neutral for a year. Uh, we, we just, nobody wants to do that. So uh, we're, we're moving, yeah, okay. we're moving. What, what, what do you think the biggest selling point or points if they're, uh, to a prospective student who's considering Concordia would look at or you would tell them yeah. about? You know, I think the things that they look at, our research tells us they're looking for academic quality and they're looking for a strong sense of connection or community. Those two things would be primary in terms of what we have to offer and what people are looking for. You know, you mentioned the other universities uh, nearby. Obviously, uh, you know, how, what's the relationship that Concordia has mm -hmm. with the, the, the other universities? You know, a really strong relationship. And I think that strength is born of the fact that, while we may overlap in some respects, uh, we, uh, we are differentiated among one another. I mean, NDSU has the great research capacity that they really focus on. Uh, MSUM has strong professional programs. We're more known for our liberal arts approach. And yet we can work together really well, sending students back and forth when we don't have a class that they might want and need, sending books around the campus, around the three campuses as though there was one library instead of three, uh, and, uh, and working together in some program areas. So it, it's a remarkable uh, tradition. And it's been going on, you know, for a long time. And with that, with your students, uh, 2,800, most of them, I'm going to assume, are come from the region, but what about yeah. international students? Yeah, we have students from, let's see, what is it, 25 countries, 150 students, 25 countries. Uh, so that, you know, in the midst of 2,800 students, that's really a, a, a great kind of leaven, if you will. Mm -hmm, sure it is. I, I guess, uh, tell us again about the timeline. Do you think it'll be next school year, probably next summer, before you actually have a president? I, I mean, think that's correct. I think next summer would be the best estimate. And yeah. and the, the uh, you said the committee is just getting underway. And That's right. We, and again, I'm just thinking that everybody in, is, has a job in a school year, so therefore it would probably just be logical, wouldn't it? Yeah, I think that I think it is logical. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess uh, finally, if people want more information about the college, where's the best place for them to go? Uh, the best place would be our web, and that would be www.cord.edu, and uh, you can log on and find out about all kinds of things. Well, I'm sure there's a lot a rich of information site, a rich on site. Yes, sir. Well, thanks so much for joining us today. It's a pleasure to have you. You're welcome. Thank you. Stay tuned for more. Walter Peel of Vinot energetically uses acrylic on canvas and paper. 
treating Western American themes with modern art influences and interpretation. His work, often large in scale, has been exhibited all across North America. Here's a look. But I think there needs to be a sort of consistency. Sometimes I'm an artist teacher, sometimes I'm uh, a teacher artist. Maybe the, the pineapple will be so powerful it doesn't matter. Teaching has allowed me to paint what I want, when I want, and, and how I want. One of the things that I did for my entertainment was uh, draw as a very, very small child. Drawing and imagery always did interest me. And so when it came time to, to think about going to college, and I wanted to go to college because I, I wanted to get out of the haystack. I knew there was more world out there. And even though I loved uh, the horse angle, the cattle angle of, of where I was at, I wanted something more. One of the instructors said, we hear that you go to rodeos on weekends. And I said, yeah, my family's involved in rodeos, this, that. He said, well, why aren't you using that as a subject matter? My reply was, I didn't think it could work. I thought uh, cowboys were inappropriate. They're too romantic. They're too uh, full of adventure in a bad way. He said, no, that's, that's not true. Any subject is appropriate. And if you want to paint that, you should paint that, but you have to find your own voice. You have to find your own way. The part about rodeo that was the most obvious to me was the action part, the bucking horses, the bucking bulls, the dynamics of horse and rider. And so I looked to the Italian futurist group of the early 1900s. They took cubism and they applied it to moving subjects. Then also I looked to the abstract expressionists, the action painters. The way in which the artist applies the paint to the canvas is important to the look of the finished work. The energy that the artist brings to the paint application should also be communicated to the viewer in the end. And so when I paint, I want people to look at it and say, wow, it looks like he did that application of paint with big brushes and a lot of energy, which hopefully enhances the movement of the subject also and the energy of the subject. Paint is a fluid medium that drips and it splatters and those uh, aren't collateral damage. Drips and splatters oftentimes are collateral enhancements. Sometimes accidents are bad accidents but sometimes the accident is the best thing that can happen to a painting. I no longer really paint in a futurist cubist style but I do use some of the same devices that the cubists and the futurists use, which would be multiple imagery. One, two, three, four. I might have a horse with six, eight, ten legs, two or three heads that might be visible in here. As this horse is moving through space, as the rider is moving through space. The process involves a chalk drawing with colored chalk. I'll do a, a basic composition. After that, I will go into it with a dark, uh, linear, painted outline of, of that, to refine that a little bit, to make changes, to give myself something to go by, something that will still show through the first applications of paint. And then, generally speaking, I go to the most fun part, that really spontaneous primary application of paint, where I am applying paint with great abandon, where the energy, most of the energy, will come into the canvas. Then I let that dry. Then I go back into it and see what I can do to resolve it, to get rid of the bad stuff, uh, keep the good stuff. After that, it's mostly fine-tuning adjustments. As this rider moves through space, we'll see this green repeating. I like polka dots and I like angular patterns on shirts for my riders. They add action. I want to see details in my paintings, but I want them to be very, very abstract in the same way. I, don't like the idea that somebody could walk to the painting the first time and just identify everything in there. I want them to find the paintings reveal themselves as they look at them several times, perhaps. Well, do you see any of the image in this one, folks? My favorite paintings that I do are ones that are more abstract. 
but my tendency to be fussy, I think, causes me many times to go back and work on paintings more than I should. Uh, I take them too far. Some parts of it I might have gone a little too far, and uh, I may regret it a little bit now, but in the end it may be just fine. Oftentimes as a painter and as a teacher, you have to talk to students about knowing when to quit on a painting. I, I have no doubt you can probably take it and make a really nice painting out of it, but it is a really nice painting right now. They have such a strong mental image of what they think this thing is to look like that they give up some wonderful, fresh, spontaneous, simple images to begin with. You have to recognize when you have something that's good and stop on it at that point, even if it doesn't match that mental image that you have for an idea of what I want to do in this painting. Taking a painting too far is the easy thing. Recognizing when to stop on it, that's the difficult part of it. Well, that's all we have on Prairie Pulse for this week. And as always, thanks for watching.